All right. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. You're in the San Francisco Dharma Collective as we speak, and we are about to embark on part five of our deep dive journey through Manjushri's Pranyaparamita Sutra. I don't need to tell you what this sutra is because this is part five, but you may notice we have a new situation. And so I just wanted to uh, kind of start us off with that. Um, and I basically need to do this because uh, we, the, the momentum of the sutra has been building up. And every Sunday we get to this kind of crescendo when things couldn't get any crazier. And then, you know, I'll see you next week. And so I want to try to, as quickly as possible, build us back up to that crescendo of wisdom so that we can kind of keep going. Because this is one of those sutras that just, it, there's no breaks. It just keeps going. Uh, and on that note, I'm about to break down part one, two, three, and four, because that's what the, we're on part five. And that's just the way this has, has happened. I don't want anybody to think that the sutra is broken into these four or five parts, it's just total circumstances. And so what I'm about to explain with my little drawing here is just where we're at in studying the sutra it has nothing to do with the format of the sutra the sutra actually just has two parts uh two big part one part two and we're still only in part one yeah uh so what i've drawn here is our five mountains our wushan as the chinese would say and the reason why this is part five so i'm having fun and there is a famous a mountain range in China called Wushan, the five peaks or the five mountains. And this Wushan is sort of closely associated with Manjushri, the crown prince of the Dharma, Bodhisattva of wisdom, who has been dispensing the information. Aside from a, a few, aside from a few casual interjections by the Buddha and a few casual interjections by Shariputra, it has just been Manjushri, Bodhisattva of wisdom, dispensing the wisdom. And in China, there are these five mountain peaks that are associated with Manjushri. In fact, people go there, they have visions of seeing Manjushri. There's a famous temple monastery too, dedicated to Manjushri. And so I thought it would be fun to make an ode to those five, the Wushan, the five mountains of Manjushri, with these sort of uh, recap of where we've been with part one, two, three, and four. So part one is our central mountain peak. This is, this is uh, Mount Seeing the Tathagata, <laughs> Mountain Seeing the Tathagata. And that was the first part of our lesson or first part of our Dharma here is that Manjushri showed up to see the Buddha or see the Tathagata, the thus come one or thus gone one. And so we spent part one just talking about this idea of this, like, not the Buddha, the dude, the historical figure, or even not even an enlightened being but Tathagata, enlightenment itself, thusness itself. How does one see thusness itself? That was part one. Then we moved to the second mountain range, which was the, the mountain range of the 10 Lakshana, the 10 characteristics or qualities or marks by which Manjushri sees the Tathagata. And if anybody was puzzled during that second part about Manjushri saying, oh, I see the Tathagata as having like the marks of not being located here or there, you know, it's helpful to keep in mind that the Tathagata, the Buddha, 
is not the signless, is not that which is without marks. In fact, that was part of uh, lesson three or the mountain peak number three. Lesson part three of this was that this Tathagata is also not without Lakshana. This interesting paradox of ha neither having kind of conventional Lakshana or characteristics or qualities, but also not being without characteristics or qualities, this kind of neither nor situation. So that was the sort of the essence of part three, I would say is sort of this getting into this really delicate logic of neither nor. And this delicate language and logic of neither nor, it's, it's, it's where we're always kind of, um, well, it's where I'm always saying that this Buddha Dharma stuff, this stuff, it's beyond uh, non-dualism because non-dualism sets up this kind of dualism between the monism and the dualism, the one, the unity, the oneness and the duality. And so what we're doing, this pranya, this wisdom that Manjushri has come to tell us about, it's neither nor, neither dualistic nor monistic in that sense. And so that was sort of the essence of part three, that the wisdom that the Manjushri came to tell us about is sort of very neither nor. And then this led to last week, part four, which was this lesson about, well, we focused in particular about sentient beings and this idea of that they're actually, even if the Buddha were to liberate all sentient beings, in reality, there are no sentient beings that would be liberated. <laughs> and that kind of paradoxical logic of, of sort of, well, the, the language that I have on our board here is not abiding in any dharma. And we've been through this in the dharma doors. We've been through this many times that this word dharma has a lot of different meanings in Buddhism. And there's a way that you could kind of interpret it here as the most basic idea of anything, anything, any phenomena, any constructed thought, concept, concept, conceptualization, whatever you, whatever, that this pranya paramita abides, rests in no dharma, no phenomena, never rests, even including the very idea of a, a particular sentient being, a unique entity. We're not abiding in such ideas as that. If we're observing, practicing, contemplating this profound pranya paramita. Those are the four parts up till now. Again, if any of that is too quick, just go back for part one through four. And now we're gonna dive back in. I'm going to take just one step back, a tiny step back to a question that the Buddha raised to Manjushri. And it's a, I think it's a great kind of turning point in the sutra. Manjushri goes, you know, full tilt where there's not even sentient beings and all of that. And so no Dharma whatsoever. And so the Buddha's question, and by the way, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm now going from my own translation that I've been doing so for tonight, it's all a fresh new translation. And so you'll get, you, you, if you have the, the original Chang English translation, you're gonna notice some differences. If anybody has the other English translation and you're reading along and you notice like, whoa, wait, that's very different, please just holler. So we're gonna be doing that. Again, if you have any questions about part one through four, Go back, review that. Otherwise, here's the Buddha's very interesting kind of question. He's, and then the Buddha asks Manjushri, 
when abiding thus in pranya paramita, in this transcendent wisdom, how can all virtuous roots be increased and harmful roots be decreased? This language of the increasing of good roots and the decreasing of bad roots, right? Harmful roots. I need, I want you to hold on. I actually don't want you to hold on, but provisionally, I need you to hold on to this language of increasing and decreasing. Meaning getting, getting better and not getting worse. Increasing good roots, getting smarter, getting more virtuous, getting purer. There's all these Buddhist ideas that are wrapped up in this language of increase and decrease. Manjushri is about to start dropping bombs on us about this increasing and decreasing. And I just want you to know what the language is referring to. It comes from this idea that the Buddha talks about. And the Buddha's question is, well, wait a minute, Manjushri. If there's no ascension beings and there's not even any Dharma or any phenomena or any anything, then how is it that good, wholesome, pure roots will increase and afflictions like greed and hatred and delusion, how will they decrease? If there's, if there's, if there's no phenomena. And, now, and we talked about this briefly last time, but we're revisiting it now as this is the starting point which is like, well, wait a minute, in this profound idea of emptiness that you're talking about where there is no phenomena, how can there be progress versus like regress? Or, you know, that's the, what is being discussed here. How can there be progress, maturation, enlightenment? Manjushri says, if one is able thus, if one is able to abide thus in pranya paramita, all good roots will neither increase nor decrease. Every dharma also neither increases nor decreases. Even this very characteristic of having the nature of pranya paramita will also neither increase nor decrease. World honored one, thus is practicing pranya paramita. Then there is no rejection of ordinary teachings, nor will there be attachment to the teachings of sages. How so? Why? Pranya paramita, is not seeing any existent phenomena, any existent dharma that could be attached to or rejected. Thus is practicing pranya paramita. Okay, I'm gonna pause there. This is the introduction to here, our fifth mountain, the mountain upon which Manjushri sits tonight. This is the mountain of not seeing. So if you remember the very, very first mountain peak, the very first part of this sutra was Manjushri came to see the Tathagata. And the Buddha says, oh, great, how do you see the Tathagata? And he says, well, I see the Tathagata as having all of these crazy characteristics. I see, as it, I see it as being neither nor. And then now we're getting to to see the Tathagata, to observe or practice Pranya Paramita is not seeing. That's the theme of tonight. In fact, for the next many pages, Manjushri is, uh, the formula will be not seeing X, Y, and Z, that is observing. The profound, that is observing pranya paramita. 
And on this first one, this entree, Manjushri's entree to this idea, he says, Pranya Paramita, this transcendent wisdom is not seeing any existent dharma that could be attached to or rejected. Thus is practicing pranyaparamita. Let me just unpack that really quickly. This is, this is of course, Buddhism, right? This is dharma that we're doing here, right? So the basic idea is attachment leads to suffering. You've heard this, right? This is the good old Four Noble Truths. This is the original program of Buddhism. Attachment, suffering, non-attachment, enlightenment. <laughs> when the Buddha was saying, how are good roots going to be increased and bad roots decreased? Well, in Buddhism, the way you increase good roots is by not clinging to stuff. For not, you know, not clinging. The way to develop or increase harmful roots is to cling. <laughs> Manju Sri just said, yeah, but when you're, when you're practicing Pranyaparamita, Pranyaparamita is not seeing anything that could be attached to or let go of. And if I could just fill in a, a little wisdom, a uh, little, if I could fill it in a little bit, that it's not seeing anyone who could be attached to anything or anyone that could be not attached to anything. So that's the idea here is that again, we're going beyond non duality, we're going beyond those ideas to this even deeper realm of neither norness. Any questions about this idea of not seeing any existent dharma that could be attached to or rejected? Right? Michael, could um, Connie here? Yeah, yeah. Question. Um, could you potentially say that um, prana paramita can only be um, experienced um i mean yeah experienced for the lack of a better word when there is um no i who is experiencing and everything else yeah that's the very essence of it it's it, it's the very you nailed it connie it's the very essence of pranya is that it is a non self-centered wisdom it's the very basis of it that as soon as that self-centered axis in space and time is relinquished, now pranya is available. But as long as you're clinging to an individual, an axis in space and time, and you know, as it pertains to the, where we're at right now, if, you're, if you have the idea of there being individuated phenomena in space and time out there, you yeah, that's all uh, knowledge to be gained from books in a library type stuff. Because the mind itself, you know, when you operate from the mind, you will always, from when you operate from the mind from this, you will always have this, this, uh, this dual understanding of the world. You can't fight it. That's the mind, what it's supposed to, or it's what it does, right? So I think often the fault is that you try to understand these teachings from, from, from your mind, right? And this will never ever go somewhere, um, <laughs> at least in my life, <laughs> it doesn't go anywhere. It, so, yeah. Indeed, Connie. And I, I would just piggyback on what you just said by saying that, that uh, the mind, the small mind, the discriminatory mind is Lakshana based. It uses discrimination of various characteristics and qualities. That's, that, that's what that mind uses. Manjushri, the Bodhisattva enlightened mind, is not fooled by Lakshana in that way. 
But the delicate balance that we're doing every Sunday night here on Dharma Doors <laughs> is trying to use Lakshana, using the Lakshanic world of appearances to, to, to point at even, you know, not even that which doesn't have Lakshana. Bigger than that, better than, better? No, <laughs> right? <laughs> but you see what I mean is that, and I'm, again, Connie, I'm just totally just rolling with what you just said versus is regarding a small mind that would use characteristics and qualities and then this beautiful game that we're playing here the language game the upaya game the skillful means game of of sort of using these you know i'm we're using the land using all these things but with the hope <laughs> that we don't get ensnared by them so. <laughs> Okay, so everybody's good with this idea of not seeing. Connie totally just nailed it, that if you're using these eyes, no, <laughs> you're not gonna, you're gonna miss it. So now we're gonna go through, so these are my five. So since this is part five and we're on the five mountains, these are the five kind of ideas that are coming up that I thought it would be fun to try to address. These are five angles on the same pranyaparamita idea. So the, these are just five different ways of looking at it. And so the first way to look at it, the first idea is that pranyaparamita is not seeing a nirvana to be enjoyed or a life to be suffered. How's that? How so? Why? Not seeing a life to be satisfied or grown weary of, nor a nirvana that could be enjoyed. Thus is practicing pranyaparamita. So this is a pretty classic formula for the Mahayana tradition. It's not quite exactly saying nirvana is samsara and samsara is nirvana. It's basically saying that. It's not quite saying that, though. What Manjushri is saying, if I can just sort of summarize, is that to observe, to practice pranyaparamita is to not see a nirvana to be achieved, nor a life of suffering to be escaped from. <laughs> and I, again, that was the original thing. That was the original thing he told us to, about, was that we are suffering in this world and the green pastures of nirvana await us on the other shore. <laughs> and this is saying, but pranyaparamita, the perfect transcendent wisdom sees no samsara or nirvana. And again, this is not quite saying samsara is nirvana, nirvana is samsara. This is saying that when you, when the mind is absorbed or is practicing pranyaparamita, there again is nobody to achieve nirvana, nobody to be suffering life in samsara, which is the, again, that, this is still Buddhism, by the way, right? If I didn't, if we didn't mention that, we're still interested in kind of not suffering in that way. But in this profound pranyaparamita way, it's not nirvana. Again, it's, it's this, it's tathata, it's thusness in that sense. Everybody good with nirvana and samsara? Dualistic opposition, right? Good and bad type of an idea. This is neither nor in that way. His an additional number two now. Oh, by the way, I need to, I should say this now before I keep repeating this. There's a word, it's a, it's a 
it's not a very um, extraordinary word. It's not a very, um, uh, out of, it's a very sh normal, straightforward Buddhist word to be using. And I'm translating it tonight as observing, obs observing pranyaparamita. Uh, what a, uh, thus, uh, or actually, no, I apologize. I'm translating a word as practicing pranyaparamita. And it's tricky because there's another Chinese word that actually means more of practice, like in a repetitive sense. The Chinese word that's being translated as observe, or sorry, as practice, it means observe, like to observe a holiday, to observe a rite, to observe a, um, um, yeah, religious sense of observance, which is a really kind of interesting word, by the way, to observe, like to observe a holiday, right? It kind of means to honor it. It kind of means to, well, you know, it means to observe it in that sense. It's a very interesting word. But of course, in English, it also means to, to see. You observe with your eyes. And so I'm translating this word as practicing pranyaparamita, but it kind of actually should be observe because it has this, um, well, A, I think, uh, I think they the Chinese wanted to avoid doing pranyaparamita, that it's like something you do, that because that gets tricky with the logic that we're in right now, where there's no doer and nothing to be done. Whereas observing is kind of this very interesting, it's kind of passive, has this religious tone of holiness. So when I say practice pranyaparamita, know that it could be observe. And that would actually kind of go really, really beautifully, poetically well with this idea of not seeing, not seeing nirvana or samsara is observing pranyaparamita, right? There's a, be there's a beautiful entendre, like a, a beautiful meaning, or a, even a double entendre in that of meaning. Um, so I just wanted to share that with you that so as you hear the rest of the sutra tonight, it's going to be saying, thus is practicing pranyaparamita. Thus is observing pranyaparamita. And that word thus too is also really wild too, because it's, it's referring to thusness. It's like, that's, that's how you do it. So Michael, just wanted to share with that with you. Michael? Yeah, no. Is it, could it, could it also be like abiding in Pranya Paramita? Because I think of observing in that sense of like observing a holiday as similar to like you're, you're just in it and it's not as active. I don't know. Yep. I would definitely not want to use abide be, because that character and that idea is very significant. And so when they say abide, they mean it. And when they say not abiding, they mean it. The character that we're talking about, which I don't think I have, yeah, I didn't write any character or I didn't write that character on the board. It's this character Xiu, and it is the character, it's the Chinese verb that you would use if you are um, if you've taken precepts and you've made a, the vow not to, to kill, and if you do that, that's shu. So practicing non-killing, eh, that's kind of not what I'm doing. I mean, I guess you could say at every second and of every moment, I'm practicing non-killing. You could go that far but it's about observing a rule. And so thanks Noam for asking, cause I could, I could add that to it to give you that flavor of what they're saying. To observe pranyaparamita like that, to uphold it, to something like that. So 
Number one was by not seeing a nirvana or a samsara, not seeing a life to be suffered, nor a release to be enjoyed. Number two, not seeing faults to be abandoned, nor seeing merit to be gained. A heart without increase or decrease toward all dharmas. How is this? By not seeing a dharma dhatu, a realm of dharma, to have any increase or decrease. World honored one. If thus able, this is called pranyaparamita. So there's the increase and decrease again. Very, very tricky language. Um, this is introducing our even wilder idea of the Dharma Dhatu, the Dharma realm, the realm of the Dharma. The first part of this, of course, is about, so practicing or observing Pranyaparamita is not seeing any faults to be abandoned or merit to be gained. This, this goes along with our kind of uh, that first idea of nothing to hold on to, nothing to let go of in that way. But in particular, the language, the language of this one, as I wrote on the board here, it's about defilement and purity. If, if the mind has afflictions or whatever, has faults, by the way, the language of faults is afflictions, kleshas, greed, hatred, delusion. So not seeing afflictions to be abandoned, not seeing any greed, hatred, or delusion to be let go of, nor seeing any virtuousness, any merit, any, not seeing any good arising. A heart, it says, or the heart, without any increase or decrease towards all phenomena. And by not seeing any realm of the Dharma to have any increase or decrease in. <laughs> World honored one, if you are able to abide thus, that is observing or practicing Pranyaparamita. Okay, that's two attempts at <laughs> saying this. As you can imagine, the, the language here in the Chinese, in the English, it's like it's complicated because these are very subtle ideas. We're, we're dealing with like double, a lot of double negatives and things like that. So on the basic level, this is saying like, the, the idea of like a defiled regular person with their greed, hatred, and delusion, and an arhat, a monk who's pure and has is virtuous, meritous, and all of that, pranyaparamita is not seeing any fault to be abandoned or any merit to be gained. And then it introduces this weird idea, which is like, it's kind of referencing the very first thing Manjushri said, which is not seeing any dharma that could be held, any dharma that could increase or decrease. That's pranyaparamita. This is taking it a step further by saying, and by not even seeing a realm in which an individuated dharma could increase or decrease. <laughs> If you, if you see the slight difference between those, the first one he was saying to see any given phenomena as increasing or decrease. Yeah, Pranyaparamita is not seeing any given phenomena. The, then he says, not seeing any realm in which there could be an individual phenomena to increase or decrease. That's practicing Pranyaparamita. Any questions about this idea of the defiled and pure idea? Neither defiled nor pure is what we're talking about. 
Sweet. World Honored One. Let's see, wait a minute. World Honored One. Not seeing all phenomena, all dharmas, as having any arising or any ceasing. This is practicing pranyaparamita. This is, uh, by the way, I'm just going to let you know now because we're we're moving right there. Um, my whiteboard is reversed, so number yeah, number three should be number. Number four should be number three, and number three should be number four. By the way, I just got those mixed up. I just realized this language, though, of neither defiled nor pure, the one we just did, and this one, neither arising nor ceasing, this should start to sound familiar. I'm not going to give it away just yet, but it should start to sound familiar. But let's talk about this idea of neither arising nor ceasing. This is some classic language of Buddhism. Um, this is some classic language of the early Buddhist program or the early Buddhist practice, which is to know that everything arises and ceases. Everything is temporary. That was the original, one of the original ideas of Buddhism. This idea of impermanence, that everything ceases, this too, shall pass right that that's the that's the the mantra this too shall pass everything that arises ceases right well world honored one not seeing any dharmas as having any arising or ceasing that's practicing pranyaparamita and this of course is this is this is an easy one to explain if you've been following along, which is when Manjushri says to not see any, any individuated phenomena, any dharma to cling to, anything to cling to, that's practicing pranyaparamita. If we've already sort of abandoned any notion of an individuated entity, existing unto itself out in space rather than a dependently originated concept being experienced subjectively, right? If we've already abandoned the idea of that thing, the thing out there, what could be there to arise and what could be there to cease? This is the teaching of the birthlessness or non-origination of all phenomena. That if, if understood properly, if understood correctly, this idea that the, the, the delineated idea of any phenomena is, a, is an act of clinging by the mind. <laughs> it's not out there to be had. So the idea is, is that all these um, dharmas neither arise nor cease. They don't come into being and they don't go out of being. Everybody good with that? And World Honored One, not seeing any dharma, not seeing all phenomena as having any increase or decrease this is practicing pranyaparamita. This is a repetition of that very idea. But again, I want to repeat what they mean by increase or decrease. Originally, they were talking about like getting better <laughs> versus getting worse in that sense. You know, progress. <laughs> and this is saying, you know, Manjushri, the pranyaparamita, 
they're saying in that within this view, there is no progress because the, again, there is nothing to progress. There is no realm in which to progress. <laughs> the very idea, concept, notion of change, arising, ceasing, increasing, decreasing, whatever it is, the very notion of any change is predicated on things in that way. <laughs> the very notion of change is this Lakshana, is a Lakshana like all the rest of them in that sense. And so again, it's, it's sort of this like, um, it's a very tricky space to be in, in terms of neither nor, not abiding as the Bodhisattva says, not abiding here, not abiding there. No arising, no ceasing, no increase, no decrease. I, I, again, I'm going to try to, I, I want to say this one more time because I know I've sort of been a, a little all over the place. Originally, this idea of increase or decrease was referring to like spiritual maturation and attainments, defilements and enlightenment. But as you get along in these Pranyaparamita Sutras, increase or decrease, they're, again, they're just talking at a very basic level of like change any kind of change, any form of progress, you know, if, if I have to, it feels like I have to do it. If I have to do it, I'm going to appeal to the dream analogy. And the idea is, is like, so let's say you're having one of those dreams and it's not a lucid dream. It's one of those, you know, dream dreams that you're convinced is real you know, those dreams. And let's say you're engulfed in one of those dreams, a nighttime sleeping dream where you, you're, you believe it's reality. And so let's say you get set to the task of, uh, I don't know what, building a sand, a giant sand castle in your dream. <laughs> the harder you work at creating that castle of sand, is there any actual development, any progress towards the completion of that castle of sand? <laughs> Does it increase or decrease? Does it make any sense to talk of the increase or decrease of that castle or sa of sand? Or is it just an ever-changing mirage of different states of completion, but without an entity, an actual essential entity there that is getting closer to completion. You see how you can have the illusion of change, the illusion of progress, the illusion of I'm almost there. Do you see how you can have it without there actually being anything there? <laughs> That's the teaching that we're, we're dealing with, which is how it is that this can appear to be progress, spiritual maturation? How could it appear that way? But in actuality, as the Buddha would say, in reality, as the Buddha would say, there is no actual progress. Well, because according to the Pranyaparamita Sutras, all phenomena, all conditioned dharmas are like a dream. <laughs> are like a mirage, are like an echo. They have that same nature of appearing as they appear, as they appear. And then, oh, look, another appearance. Oh, then, and look, another appearance. And there can be this succession of appearances without any essential thing underneath that being the thing that is increasing or decreasing or arising or ceasing or to be defiled or pure. By the way, that's the Heart Sutra, right? That within emptiness, 
all these dharmas neither arise nor cease, are neither defiled nor pure, and neither increase nor decrease. The order is a little different in this sutra, but it doesn't matter because that's why it's the heart sutra. It's the essence of these teachings. So everybody good with that? I mean, that was that's pro uh, profound ideas <laughs> to be given it's their, their due respect in that way of time. <laughs> Questions, comments, ideas? Okay. So now number five, which is actually a three-parter. Hmm. World honored one. And he's still, Manjushri is still explaining to us how to properly practice or observe Pranyaparamita. He says, world honored one. Not beauty or ugliness. Not giving rise to high or low. Neither being attached nor equanimous. How so? Dharma is without beauty or ugliness because it is free of all lakshana, all characteristics. Dharma without high or low because its nature is without variance. And Dharma without attachment nor equanimity, upeksha, because it abides in the region of truth. This is practicing pranyaparamita. So again, this is the three-parter. Number five has these three parts, which is that in observing pranyaparamita, one does not observe beauty or ugliness. There's a great, play, uh, there's a great uh, play of words in the Chinese that I tried to capture. So in observing or practicing pranyaparamita, one does not give rise to high or low. A funny, again, a funny play to give rise to the notions of superior or inferior is, is actually what the language means. To not see something as great, superior, nor inferior and low, that is observing pranyaparamita, so not giving rise to high or low. And then this uh, third one, being without attachment and also without upeksha, without equanimity. This is practicing pranyaparamita. So again, this is sort of like, it, it, it's like, I thought we were, I thought upeksha was it. I thought equanimity was it. If you, you know, if you're an old school Shravaka, as achieving equanimity is that's paramount to enlightenment that's paramount to nirvana and so this again this pranya paramita says ah even that opposition between upadana and upeksha between attachment and non-attachment to equanimity even that in the practice or observing of pranya paramita there is no attachment nor equanimity. Is everybody vibing on how that makes total perfect sense within the Pranyaparamita? Uh, no, not really. Talk to me. And, <laughs> and I can't, I can't, um, I'm, I'm I'm wondering if it, if it's if it's helpful to to think about like this is in response to maybe a bunch of people just like doing it wrong like just being pious being chill not fucking shit up and, but not actually being liberated and sort of saying like no liberation is actually like beyond any of this stuff you guys are doing it wrong or you've been doing it wrong or if it really like that's not it's not helpful or that's not true. Um, 
to, mm -hmm. to try to like think about it as a response to maybe like getting getting the, the dharma wrong like you know it's the yep. supreme letting go that like allows you to understand the truth of things yep there's two things going on in your question brendan really great question one which i i've been uh i've been um i've been supporting what you're setting up which is this sort of like the old school new school and while historically i do think that there was a kind of a revolution in buddhism that led to the so-called bodhisattva path and the mahayana and that that revolution sort of saw hierarchical and systematic problems within the church of Buddhism or within the movement of Buddhism. So I do think a lot of it is like that. But I, I also think, and again, I'm sort of uh, guilty in that sense of supporting that opposition. So what I wanna suggest though, is that this pranya, this pranya paramita, this transcendent wisdom what they say is you know that this is buddha wisdom this is the way the buddha sees things not how an arhat or uh, whoever or, uh, maharishi whoever sees it but how the buddha sees it and and what i mean by that is is that even the vajra sutra the kind of origin of at least this genre of sutra the origin of this the diamond sutra itself Shibuti's question is like, yeah, but what, how do you, what about Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, like supreme unsurpassable enlightenment? What, if, what about that? And that's where the Buddha says, oh, you want to know about supreme unsurpassable enlightenment? Oh, well, then there's actually no sentient beings that get liberated, actually. Now, yeah. <laughs> but I want to go, so that's the first part, uh, Brendan, that I want to like, so the first thing I wanted to, to say in response to Brendan's question is that, yes, this is a way of putting down the so-called Hinayana, but it's also just a way of speaking about a next level that is present in early Buddhism. I always say this, the emptiness, shunyata, these teachings are in the early school. And these sutras can be seen as just like meditations on that deep, deep level of the old school, if that makes sense. Yeah. But now I want to do number two, though. I want to do number two, the deeper, funner one about what's going on here. And I want, so I want to just try to use an example. This is for anybody else or anybody who is still a little confused about this idea of like, there's that Manjushri doesn't see any, anything there to be grasped. Manjushri doesn't even see anything there to be grasped or let go of. He, it, so what does it mean to be in that neither nor state? I, I wanna just use a quick example. We've got lots of time. I wanna use a, this kind of classic example of um, you know, what would be called objective reality versus pure subjective reality. And the example is imagining that I have an apple in my hand. And there are some among us who have certain types of eyes and certain rods and cones, if you will, to see the apple as being red, red delicious. There are others among us who have the rods and cones to see it as that, that sour green, green crispy apple, that sour green, right? So some people like red delicious and some people like that crispy green, right? So the idea is, is that if I were to hold up the apple and I were to ask, what color is the apple, red or green? This is a very, very simple example of what Manjushri is talking about, which is that the idea is, is that the apple is no color, but to the person who has certain types of eyes, it appears 
red. And to certain other people with certain other types of eyes, it appears green. It is neither red nor green. Right? <laughs> is everybody with me on that? That there is no red or green. It depends on the eye, yeah? I mean, I like the example of there's no objective reality because nobody actually has that information to access to that information. So like, what would you, what would we even be talking about? But I know that's a little bit more like nope. gets, in, gets in people's faces about like. That's exactly what we're talking about though, which is that if I had the apple and we, there was a debate because there were a bunch of people like, no, it's a red apple. No, it's a green apple. You, you would want the grand decider to come in and declare who's right, who's wrong, what color is it really? But the idea is, is that if that grand observer is observing the apple, so it's red, all that says is, is that person has the same rods and cones that is making it appear to be red as those other people that have the same rods and cones that makes it appear red. That's all that it'll say. What, of course, this is saying, what Brendan alluded to, is that there is no view from above to declare what color it really is. There isn't, there isn't that view. Is everybody okay with that there isn't that view of it? And so it is neither red nor green? So if you're okay with that idea that there is no red or green apple. It's just red for these people, green for those people, right? That color is a characteristic or a quality. It's a lakshana. And it's, I use the color one because we know about color blindness. We can imagine actually like, oh, if I had totally different eyeballs, it would actually appear differently. Like I know that we can all sort of imagine that but can you imagine that that same, that same uh, dependent origination, actually, that same dependent origination is not only producing the color of said apple, but the perception of the shape of said object that is informing me that it is an apple to begin with. Not to mention the flavor. Ooh, it's so sweet. It must be an apple. That is also a dependently originated phenomena. The sweetness is not in the apple, nor is it in my tongue. It arises upon the contact. The color arises upon contact. The shape arises upon the contact. The feeling of the waxy surface arises upon the contact. And so all the lakshana of said phenomena are not out there in my hand. They are all arising in the in-between. And so the red or green, apple or orange or this or that, they're all dependently originated. They are all, and so the idea here is, is like, Let's say, let's say you were addicted to red delicious apples. You're just addicted to them. That was the defilement. It was the defilement that you need that the Buddha was telling you you needed to let go of. Right? Yeah, here's the red apple, and you could you could let go of and be released of the red apple, or you could actually go and, and change your eye. And, and make it look green because <laughs> it's not red. <laughs> it's not, actually not red. So you could abandon the illusion of the red apple or you could abandon illusions altogether. That's what we're talking about here. Again, this was just a summary of this idea of how of what Manjushri means when he says, I don't even see anything out there to increase or decrease or to be defiled or pure. Because he's saying eh, it's all dependently originated. And then 
because everybody looks wonderfully confused as it is. The Apple, all of the, the information I just gave you about the Apple, it's dependently originated nature and all of that, go, it goes for the observer as well. The, the color, the shape, the size, the taste, the texture, all of these things are also dependently originated. There is no you there to be grasping at the apple or anything. Thus is practicing pranyaparamita. Um, Michael, I would love to um, um, look at this uh, from a different um, perspective, in a sense of, I mean, um, this notion of there is no I, so everything dissolves is the ultimate understanding of the whole teaching. But um, besides the perception, what you just uh, explained with the apple, I think, you know, when I really try to embody what's said, you know, and really bring me into this intellectual understanding but experienced understanding and for me the only get gateway in order to get a taste of it maybe let's put it in that way is when I completely and it is it sounds so naive or, or simple but completely be in completely be in the here and now and um, in the sense of for example if I see an apple <clears throat> and I'm completely here and now I don't want to grab the apple so increase it or get it like consume it because I don't think about oh the apple tastes so delicious and I want it mm -hmm. nor do I like oh I had an apple yesterday which was awful that's why I don't want an apple today and so I reject it you know what I'm saying so mm -hmm. for me this is this is the same thing with partnership or with everything with so the gate will to really exp uh, prania paramita is um, the full em embodiment um, experience of the timeless existence of everything and all. Yeah. So I, anyway, I think I wanted to bring in the, the time, the aspect of time and past and future. Yeah, in the in the context. So yeah. Yeah, and I would love to, to, again, kind of keep going with what you're talking about. So I want to, I, I want to add, it's a very, um, it's a very subtle, um, it's a very subtle aspect to what Connie was just saying. So yes, Connie, this, you know, again, this is Buddhism. So it's always the same as far as like, these attempts to bring us into real presence, like really, really present, really, really. And what I mean by that, what I mean by that is, you know, I, I say this because Connie mentioned time. Everybody likes to talk about time. So let's talk about time. You know, ye yesterday is a, is a fiction. The events of yesterday are at, they are as gone as a hundred years ago, right? They're equally a memory or whatever you want to call it. Let's call it, you know, imagination or fantasy or an illusion or a dream or whatever. But everything from the past is equally gone. It's not like 10 minutes ago is somehow less not real than a hundred years ago, right? They are equally, they're made of the same non-realness, right? Boom. So can we embrace and accept how all past is fantasy, my fan, like fantasy that is relative to the clinging future, anything regarding tomorrow, 10 year, 20 years, everything that way. Also, just like actually before, equally not real, equally an, an imagination, equally whatever, right? Great. Now, now we're approaching that, the, the tathata, which I spoke, the, the thus, this, thus, this. Now we're approaching it, Connie. We're approaching like a presence, a full presence. 
now I can tell you what I wanted to tell you, which was that even in this profound total present moment, there's this still very interesting dualistic divide that happens between what I understand to be me versus that which I understand to not be me. You, everybody else in the Zoom room, the laptop, the walls of this, everything else, right? It, it goes that way, <laughs> everything else, and then me. What this profound pranyaparamita is suggesting to us, what this uh, dharma of dependent origination is saying is that all of these things you're experiencing are you, that you're on both sides of the equation, actually. <laughs> Part of the illusion is this inside outside idea. And it's actually truly a delusion because we're deluded by it and we don't know that these things are our own minds. And so we're like, oh, gimme, gimme, gimme. Wait, where to go? Gimme, gimme, whoa, where to go? And it's this constant round. This is the cause of samsara going round and around and around is chasing after things that we think are not ourselves when they are in fact our very own creations of our own mind or the mind or whatever, because even the agent and I am a product of this very clinging and grasping. Oh, look, there I am. Oh, wow, where did I come from? From you. As soon as there's you, there's me. As soon as there, there's the thing I, I want, oh, there I am. It's this, and so again, I, I, Connie, I just wanna bring us to this present moment, but then even take us deeper into this present where we are both sides of the present, not just the observer and the observed, some you even Connie, I think said it one night, the observed is the observer. Yeah. The experienced is the experiencer, right? Yeah, yeah. We've got all, all these layers. <laughs> Woo! Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you. Michael. Yeah, no, I saw you I saw you had the hand oh. and hearts and tears of joy. <laughs> oh, good. Um, just to remind myself uh, to the, the memory of the question, you know, what is a lifespan that came from the 42 verses, you know, a, a day, a meal, a single breath. And that's my, so that's a remarkable thing for me to remember. And it's, it stays with me. Oh, it's a lovely thing. As I hear this, this, that it doesn't exist. Where does it exist? Where does, where is it? Where, where, what, what are the Dharma? Thank you. Take a breath. <laughs> right. Oh, where? Right. That was Manjushri, one of Manjushri's first things. I see the Tathagata as not abiding anywhere, not being locatable. Beautiful. Michael? Yeah, no. I don't know if I'm going to be able to ask this question. But I'm <laughs> give, it, give it your best shot. Earlier, I was thinking about, t t uh, now I'm going to use the word, not practicing, but touching pranyaparamita, touching this wisdom as we can do, we can do it as we are here with words and, and interaction and thoughts, even though it, we know that it's beyond thoughts, but we can use language to try to get there. We can also do it in, in practice, I think, in meditation, in, in cushion practice, I mean. But that now, as you were talking about attachment Hi, there's, you know, when you're the prana, the, the prana paramita, the wisdom of the prana paramita does, there is no beauty, ugliness, there is no high low, there is no attachment, nor is there equanimity. Is that, is, is, is the, 
what can we do with that information? We can talk about it. We can tr we can do what we're doing now. We could also like try to experience it or can we use it as a marker of like, oh, I think that's beautiful or that's ugly. Huh, I'm not right now practicing pranayaparamita with me. You know what I mean? <laughs> I do. <laughs> or, or some other way, like what, I'm not trying to say like, what's the point of all this? That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm just trying to understand the different ways of experiencing it or understanding it. Yeah, Noam, um, I, I think that's, I, I do that often, um, which is when I kind of have trouble understanding what the Buddha is talking about, I just try to imagine the opposite of it. Yeah. And, and like you said, it's like, I can kind of really get a good sense of what not Pranayaparamita <laughs> is. Yes. But, but to, to um, add something constructive to what you just said, you know, so much of this, is truly profound, but also truly practical. And what, what I'm referring to is, is, you know, let's take this paramita, the first perfection, the first paramita of giving. The idea is, is that, you know, giving is, uh, giving is great. Dana, making a donation, making an offering, uh, giving, you know, giving is, is great. And, you know, to even the most, you know, uh, how can I say the, the most miserly, you know, person, you know, who, who's like, you know, miserly and just has a pile, you know, a pile of gold. And they're like, ha ha, all my gold. Even yeah, for them to take one little, little flake, mm -hmm and give it to somebody and be like, okay, mm. here you go. Mm. That's, that's good. Mm. Giving generosity is good. But what if one actually truly practically gives without an ego, mm -hmm. without a sense of Oh, the good thing I did, that person was really struggling. I really helped them out. It was actually giving in a way without an ego. That's Pranyaparamita and it's kind of profound. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't undercut or diminish old school giving, ego-centered giving, tax, give me my tax donation. It doesn't undercut that, but it adds this profound level or layer of practice where it's like, yeah, and if you want to be a Buddha, try giving without any ego. Try to actually like imagine where, you know, as a, as a precursor, just as a, as a stepping stone, imagine you're actually giving to yourself. <laughs> mm. Like, you know what I mean? Imagine that you're the other person that is now, so flip it and be the, the receiver. Don't be the, the nice person giving, be the, and then be a total bodhisattva and don't even see gift giver and recipient. Yeah. That It's like, whoa, that's really profound. But I don't think that is actually that exalted. I don't think that's actually that like, wow, like, wow. I don't, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Cause I think that we know the slight difference if not major difference between giving egotistically, self-centeredly, but still good and giving in a way where you're actually not in it for you at like at all, at all, at all. And then start going down the paramitas, start going down the list of perfections, moral discipline. Don't be morally disciplined for your benefit, mm -hmm. for your karma's sake. Be morally disciplined for all sentient beings' sake. That's the pranya move. Not, yes, being morally disciplined, not killing, not stealing, not lying. Those are good qualities, everybody develop those qualities, but imagine the next level where you, it, 
it's you're doing it for all sentient beings, not for your own maturation, for the increasing of your good roots and the decreasing of your harmful roots. No increase or decrease. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Thank you. Yeah, I don't even. I, I that was one of those ones. I didn't even know who I was answering anymore. So I, apolo I apologize. <laughs> Okay, everybody want a, a little more, a little more? I mean, now we're, we're gonna get to the point where it just kind of goes off the rails, goes off the rails. And what I mean by that, so, <laughs> and actually this is great, uh, after my, my kind of uh, rant, my Dharma rant there, then the Buddha says to Manjushri, asks Manjushri, then Buddha Dharma, all this Buddha Dharma, all these teachings, all the Dharma, there's no victory. There's no attainment of victory, question mark. That's what the Buddha says. So in the practice of Buddha Dharma, there's no victory. And this term victory is, you know, it's, uh, I think in the uh, Greek tradition, it's Nike, Nike is victory. Nike is this, uh, and it's actually Nike is a big uh, term in the Bible, the New Testament, for this like victory over the devil, victory over evil. So it's an interesting idea of like spiritual victory. And this is the Buddha saying, well, wait a minute, Manjushri. So in the Buddha Dharma, there's no victoriousness. There's, there's, and this, of course, is in line with like there not being any nirvana to achieve or samsara to escape, no roots to be cut off, no merit to be accrued. There's no victory to be attained, no victory, right? And the Buddha asks this sort of rhetorically, by the way, in the Chinese. He's like, so, so in the Buddha Dharma, there's no victory? That's how it should be read, by the way. <laughs> the the Buddha is sort of being rhetorical there. And Manjushri says, I do not see anything. I do not see any Dharma as having the characteristic of victory. You, the thus come one, the Tathagata is self enlightened to the realization that all Dharmas are empty. The Buddha told Manjushri, so it is. So it is, the thus come one, the Tathagata is rightly enlightened, self-realizing the emptiness of all Dharma. Or technically specifically, the Buddha actually says, so it is, so it is, the thus come one, the Tathagata is rightly enlightened, self-realizing the empty Dharma. I've been having trouble translating. This is, it's starting to get very hard to translate this thing because he seems to be saying, so it is, so it is. Um, the thus come one is rightly enlightened. And I'll explain that in a minute, but is fully enlightened, self-realizing this emptiness of dharmas, this, this thing that we've been talking about, this thing I have been trying to explain all night, this thing we've been talking about all night, this, that there's no dharmas really to increase or decrease. Manjushri says, the Buddha himself has realized this empty dharma. Yeah, Robert. Yeah, I kind of feel like, um, for me, it, it's the, the raft that what am I doing here listening to you? Why am I sitting on my cushion every day? Uh, uh, but once you become enlightened, you get rid of the raft and it's empty. But right now, I kind of like the raft, but I'm not clinging to... I, I, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it, it, there's so many paradoxes and contradictions that this one seems... I don't know. I'm tying uh, loose threads together. Hmm. You know, Robert, I, I just want to share with you, this is an, an insight that came up uh, for me earlier today, working with a, a different sutra, doesn't matter though, it's it totally in line with what you were just saying. 
And it was a great line in the sutra about bodhisattvas. It was about the bodhisattva path. And it was about how the bodhisattvas do not seek pleasure, nor are they attached to pleasure. And, you know, that's a classic line. That's a classic line about a bodhisattva, that they don't seek pleasure, delights, nor are they attached to pleasures or delights. There's something I think that's very, very important in the way that that's worded. And it's not just in this one sutra that it's worded this way. This is the Buddha's teaching. This is the, the idea. And what, so let's substitute pleasures and delights. Let's just substitute joy. Bodhisattvas don't seek joy and they're not attached to joy. The way that I teach the Dharma, the way that I teach these sutras in the Bodhisattva path, that does not mean that Bodhisattvas are not joyful. It means they don't seek it. And when, when if they are having it, they are not attached to it. <laughs> I see those as two totally different things seeking attachment versus the actual, the actual being joyful. That's neither seeking and depending if how you're doing it, nor attached. And I've used an example, one example I used to use a long time ago. I haven't used it for a while, so I'll use it. It's very simple. You, you know, you want to go see you, the movie theaters are back open. Did you hear? and you want to go see it, your favorite movie that you've been waiting to see for months now, waiting for the movie theaters to get back open. And so you go and you're sitting in the movie theater and your the movie's happening and you're like, wow, this is what I've been waiting. Oh, this is so great. Great, have a good time. Right in the middle of your favorite movie that you've been waiting now months to see, the film breaks or the electricity goes out, but there's no more movie. If you are attached to the joy and you're like, ah, oh, turn the movie back on, I'm suffering now and I will continue to suffer until the movie turns back on. You will continue to suffer for the rest of eternity because <laughs> of the seeking, because of the wanting. But if the movie, the electricity goes out and you turn to your friend and you're like, what do you want to do now? Because that's done. That's done. The movie's not coming back on. I'm not attached to it. I'm not a joy seeker. I'm a joy haver. What, what, what's, what's next? That's the bodhisattva move. Not seeking, not attached. I don't know if that helped, Robert, but that's what came to mind. This is about seeking an attachment, not about the, the experience in that way. All right. So I was hoping we could get, let's see, that's the victory. We got no victory. Everybody doing good? I'm not going to, I'm going to try not to go over time this time. By the way, this the part I just read about the that the 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 Tathagata, the Buddha, the thus come one is rightly enlightened, self-realizing, the emptiness of all dharmas. That that line is a very carefully worded line. That, um, yeah, I won't get too into it, but it has to do with this idea that Buddhas are self-enlightened meaning they, they figure this stuff out on their own. And I'm not saying that you're not a Buddha because you're listening to me. It's not about that. It's that a Buddha is somebody who like actually themselves get understands the emptiness of all dharmas to use this and is not a, just a, uh, you know, I heard the, I heard all I, dharmas are empty. Yeah. I heard that too. All yep, that's what we heard. <laughs> It's about actually, so the language is very careful about all of that. 
And then this is where, so the magistrate says this whole thing that, you know, uh, within the emptiness of dharmas, there's nothing that could be victorious. And, and the Buddha says, so it is, so it is. The thus common is rightly enlightened, self-realizing the emptiness of all dharmas. So then Manjushri asks the Buddha, world honored one, within this emptiness of dharmas, is there anything like victory that could possibly be attained? The Buddha says, superb, superb Manjushri. It is as you have spoken. Is not that the true Dharma? It is as Manjushri says, Anuttara is called Buddha Dharma. <laughs> and Manjushri says, it as the Buddha has spoken, Anuttara is Buddha Dharma. How's that? There being no dharma to be held or grasped, that is called anuttara. <laughs> so this is one of those sections where it helps to know the because you're reading it and you realize that. Uh, so, for example, in in the in, in the old school English one. What do they do? They do the weird thing where they say, uh, excellent, excellent, superb, superb, Manjushri. What you say is true Dharma. The unexcelled is the Buddha Dharma. And Anuttara means unexcelled, unsurpassable, nothing higher. But it's interesting that in the Chinese, it's transliterated, Anuttara. <laughs> not unexcelled. And so it's a very interesting part where, and the, you know, this is, this is, it's too, too late to actually start talking about this, but it, it's an important aspect or important moment where, well, it, I mean, basically just to cut to it, it's where we start getting into mantras where it is actually the word anuttara, which happens to mean unexcel, but they are referring to the actual word anuttara. And so he says, excellent, excellent. Manjushri has spoken the true Dharma. It's as Manjushri has said, anuttara is called Buddha Dharma or Buddha Dharma is called Anuttara. And again, it's too late to, because it's time, but this is where the, the sutra actually, so this is where we'll pick up next week. The sutra now starts to getting into what is called a Dharma. All night, for an hour and a half now, we have been talking about all dharmas being empty. At this point, the sutra says, okay, and now we're going to deal with that which is called a dharma. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, we are past phenomenal reality, and we are now, next week, going to start interrogating the language game itself. <laughs> yeah, so stay tuned for that. I'll have more new fresh translations. Jenny, by the way, we got this is we got a whole new no sutra coming. I'm practically done, so we got we got work to do. All right, folks, that's it for me.